Please remain standing as I read to you from Acts chapter 16, and I'll ask you also to remain standing after the scripture reading for a moment of prayer. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 25, and reading through verse 34. Most of you will find this to be a very familiar passage, but it's a gloriously wonderful passage, and even if you're familiar with it, I think you will rejoice in it again today. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let's bow together for prayer. Speak, Lord, in the stillness of this hour as we wait on thee. Hush each heart to listen with expectancy, and may no face be seen, no voice be heard, except that of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is worthy, and we ask it in his precious and holy name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. We come here to this 16th chapter of the book of Acts, and we find Paul and Silas, in prison in Philippi. And if you read the preceding verses, you will find the reason that these men were in prison. They had uh, cast the demon out of a young girl. This demon enabled their, her masters to make a great deal of money. This demon enabled this young girl to tell fortunes. And she made, as I said, her masters a great deal of money by this ability to tell fortunes. Well, Paul cast the demon out of her, and the masters of this young woman were enraged. And so they engineered the arrest of Paul and Silas. And they weren't content just to have them arrested. They had them severely beaten. And here we find them in prison. Now we meet this jailer. I think it's uh, safe to assume that this jailer did not belong to the upper crust of society. If there had been a list of the 100 most influential people in Philippi, <laughs> this man would not have made the list. He was uh, just a common, ordinary man. I think probably a crude, rough sort of man. And here he is now with uh, Paul and Silas in his prison. It may seem absurd for me to say so, but this uh, jailer has certain lessons to teach us. You may have noticed the title of the sermon is uh, Things to Learn from a Jailer. Here we are, let's say 2,000 years removed from the events here in Acts chapter 16, and you may be astonished at the claim that this man has lessons to teach us. You may be saying, what? You've already admitted that this man was a crude, rough man. He was probably 
uneducated. What uh, possible significance could he have for us? What, what lessons could he teach us? Well, I want to suggest three lessons to you. Very valuable lessons indeed. The first one is that he teaches us, ladies and gentlemen, that there's a great danger to avoid. A great danger to avoid. And the second lesson is there's a great Savior to receive. A great Savior to receive. And the third lesson is that there's a great joy to experience. A great joy to experience. So now think with me about the first of these. There's a great danger to avoid. This man, when he had Paul, when he had Paul and Silas in his prison, he uh, didn't realize that these, probably at first, that these were not just ordinary prisoners. He uh, was probably expecting this to be just an ordinary night, and an ordinary night might have included uh, prisoners crying out in pain and anguish. An ordinary night might have included prisoners cursing. But Paul and Silas were not ordinary prisoners. These men there in the darkness of the prison and in their chains, these men were singing praises to God, Paul and Silas. And the other prisoners were listening. I rather like the way Alexander McLaren, the great uh, English preacher from many years ago in Manchester, England, I rather like the way he put it. He said, these birds sang in a darkened cage. Yes, Paul and Silas. Singing, praising God, even though they had been severely beaten, singing and praising God there in the prison. That must have uh, surprised this jailer to no small measure. And then another surprise. <laughs> he might have thought this was going to be an ordinary night, but no, it wasn't. These are not ordinary prisoners. And now an earthquake strikes. A great earthquake, the Bible says. So great that it jars the doors of the prison open and it even breaks the chains of the prisoners. And this man, assuming that his prisoners had all fled and escaped, was about now to end his own life. He preferred to die by his own hand rather than to endure the public humiliation and death at the hands of the magistrates. But before he could carry out the deed, Paul said, do yourself no harm, we're all here. And then this man cried out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was asking Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest of all questions, a question I hope that if you have not asked yet to this point in your life that you will feel compelled to ask even today, what must I do to be saved? And some people would say to me, now preacher, don't read too much into this uh, question that this man asked. Maybe he, maybe he was simply... Uh, wondering how he could escape the wrath of his superiors. Maybe that's what he was wondering about. How can, I be, how can I be saved from the wrath of these men to whom I must answer? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Silas certainly didn't take it that way, did they? Because Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so it's very clear how Paul took the question, isn't it? And now here is the great danger to avoid. This man suddenly realizes that he almost stepped over the thin line that separates us from eternity. And oh, dear friends, it is a very thin line that separates us from eternity. And this man realizes that he had almost stepped over that line. And here, ladies and gentlemen, now is the great danger that he teaches us to avoid. And that is the danger of not being prepared to go out into eternity. I wonder, are you prepared to go out 
into eternity. You may be there sooner than you expect. You could be out in eternity before this day is over. Are you prepared? And this is the great danger that we must all avoid at all cost. Do you think much about eternity? You may have heard the story of Arthur Stace. Uh, Arthur Stace was converted to Christ when he was a young man living there in the city of Sydney, Australia. And two years later, he heard a preacher by the name of John Ridley preach. And John Ridley, in the course of his sermon, said, Oh, he said, I wish I could get this word eternity to sound in the ears of everyone living in Sydney. And that comment from John Ridley lodged itself in the mind and the heart of Arthur Stace. He couldn't get away from it. And so Arthur decided to do something about it. He decided that he would just take chalk and he would begin writing the word eternity wherever he could find a space there in the city of Sydney. So each night he went out with his chalk and he began writing the word eternity. Maybe on the sidewalk, maybe on a park bench somewhere. And this began to catch the attention of the people who lived in Sydney, this word eternity. And Arthur Stace didn't do this, ladies and gentlemen, for a week or two, even a month or two, even a year or two. He did it for 35 years. And there was great mystery for a long time about the identity of this man who was going around Sydney writing the word eternity in all these places. Finally, a reporter tracked Arthur Stace down and uh, revealed his identity to the people there in Sydney. And from that time forward, Arthur Stace was known as Mr. Eternity. And it is estimated that he wrote the word eternity no less than 500,000 times there in the city of Sydney over a period of 35 years. Well, Arthur Stace had eternity on his mind. It was a reality to him. I wonder how much eternity is on your mind. I wonder if it is a reality to you. Do you think much about eternity? Well, dear friend, you would be wise to do so because you are going to leave this world someday. And when you leave this world, you're going to go out into vast, boundless eternity. And eternity is not just one thing. Eternity has two parts to it. There's eternal life. And there is eternal destruction. And so the question is, not only do you think about eternity, but do you realize these two parts to eternity, and have you prepared when you leave this world to enter into eternal life? Nothing is more important. And we're constantly bombarded in this society, ladies and gentlemen, with what the pundits and the experts considered to be the greatest issues of the day. We hear constantly about the economy, and we hear constantly about world tensions and the possibility of nuclear war, and rising prices are much on everyone's mind in these days. But, oh, dear friends, these things all pale in comparison to the greatest of all issues. The greatest of all issues is eternity. Because, you see, these things all pertain to life in this world. And life in this world speeds by. It will soon be over, and these issues then will have no importance to you. But eternity will be of utmost importance. Now, whenever I ask you, are you prepared for eternity, I'm essentially asking you, have you been saved? Because the Bible teaches 
to be prepared for eternity, we must be saved. Saved. And when I hear someone use that word, I, this question always comes to my mind. Saved from what? The Bible constantly puts this before us. To safely enter into eternity, we must be saved. Saved from what? And the Bible's answer is equally clear at that point. Saved from our sins and the results of our sins. We can't enter safely into eternity if we go out into eternity in our sins. We must have our sins forgiven before we can safely enter into eternity, before we can enjoy eternal life. We must have our sins forgiven. And so here's the great danger that we are to avoid. Thank goodness for this common, ordinary, rough, crude jailer. He teaches us about this danger, the danger of going unprepared into eternity. But that brings me to the second great lesson that this man teaches, and that is <laughs> there's not only a great danger to avoid, but there's a great Savior to receive. And when this man cries out here to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas don't have to fumble for the answer. They're very clear and emphatic about it. They say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as the New King James Version puts it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. I sometimes find myself wondering how church professionals would be inclined to answer that question today. What must I do to be saved? Some people might uh, be inclined to say, well, <laughs> if they were dealing with this Philippian jailer, they might be inclined to say, well, now, get a hold of yourself. Uh, it's okay. Don't you realize that everybody is, everybody is already okay? There's nothing to fear. You can go out into eternity and not have any concern about it because we're all headed to heaven. Some people might be inclined to say, well, you've got to do as many good works, uh, more good works as you, uh, than you do bad works. You, you, it's a matter of, of living a good, decent life. But Paul doesn't say, well, no, <laughs> he doesn't say any of these things. He doesn't say, oh, get a grip on yourself, it's okay. He doesn't say, you know, you've got your own gods, and uh, we're not here to try to take you away from your own gods. Uh, your gods are as good as our God. It's okay. No, Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And dear friends, that answer that Paul gave that jailer on that occasion has not changed one iota in all the centuries that have come and gone since this occasion. If you were to ask today, what must I do to be saved? The answer is the same. God says to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God's answer hasn't changed. And... You might wonder about that answer. You might say, well, what is there about Jesus Christ? What, what has Christ done? What has Jesus done that uh, I should believe in him? What has Jesus done to be the Savior for sinners? And that's a wonderful question. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that first of all, Jesus was a special man. Special man. Why, why did Paul say, believe on the Lord Jesus? Why didn't he say, well, you know that fellow over there, he seems to be a pretty decent, upright, moral fellow. Believe on him. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. He's so specific about this. And, and what what is the, the truth about Jesus? He, he was like no other person who has ever lived. You've never said enough about Jesus 
You've never said the whole truth about Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, until you say that Jesus was the God-man. Fully God, fully man at one and the same time. There's only been one God-man who has ever occupied the stage of human history, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The God-man. You might say, is that important? Well, I should say it is important. Jesus was already God by nature, but the Bible says he took our humanity. And now, in addition to being God, he is man. He did not, by the way, divest himself of his deity when he took our humanity. He added to his deity our humanity. And here's this great conflict now between God and man. It's the sin issue. And Jesus, by virtue of being both God and man, can bring God and man together. And he's the only one who can. He's the only one who can resolve this issue. And not only was Jesus a special man, but he, he did a special work. And the work of Jesus primarily consisted of two great, two great things. One, he lived a perfect life. And two, he died a special kind of death. I, I read, and I'm sure many of you do as well, I read surveys of religious opinion here in the United States. And sometimes I'm appalled by what I read. And some surveys in recent uh, years have indicated that even many evangelicals, you may say, what's an evangelical? An evangelical is a Bible believer. And many evangelicals now say that they think Jesus probably made mistakes, committed sins. And oh, dear friend, you better hope and pray Jesus didn't commit any sins when he was here on this earth because if Jesus had sinned, he himself would have been a sinner and he would have had to pay for his own sins and he could not therefore have paid for the sins of anybody else. You may be ready to give up that point. I'm not. You see, God demands oh, a perfect righteousness of us in order to get into heaven. God says, you must be as holy as I am to enter into heaven. Be ye therefore perfect even as I am perfect. And some of you are saying now, well, preacher, you just turned heaven into a ghost town. If we have to be perfect in order to get into heaven, there is absolutely no hope for any of us. Oh, dear friends, we do have to be perfect. You've got to be righteous to get into heaven. God demands 100% righteousness of you. You don't have it, do you? And I don't have it. I read that my righteousness in the sight of God is as filthy rags. But thank God, Jesus has the righteousness that God demands. And he lived that perfectly righteous life. And the good news of the Bible is that the righteousness of Jesus can be put to my account if I will believe in him. And so Jesus, this special man, did special work. The first part of that special work, he lived a perfectly righteous life. And then he went to the cross of Calvary, and there he died a special kind of death. You must never... Never think, when you're talking about the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, you must never think of Jesus dying just an ordinary death. There were thousands of men being crucified in the days when Jesus was crucified. That was the Romans' preferred means of execution. Thousands of men being crucified. And yet we don't say, well, look at that man over there being crucified believe in him. Look at that man over there being crucified. Believe in him. We, we say, look at Jesus being crucified. Why? Because Jesus was dying a special kind of death. God says, ladies and gentlemen, that in order for us to enter into heaven, 
our sins have to be taken out of the way. And there is only one way, only one way. Are you listening? Only one way that your sins can be taken out of the way. The penalty for your sin has to be paid. And what an awesome penalty it is. Eternal separation from God. And here now is the special nature of the death of Jesus. When Jesus died on that cross, ladies and gentlemen, he actually received the penalty that we deserve for our sins. I like the way Adrian Rogers used to put it. Adrian used to say, eternity was compressed upon Jesus when he was there on the cross. And here's Jesus now, the God-man, God stepping into human history, God living the perfect life, the God-man living the perfect life that we have refused to live, the God-man going to the cross of Calvary and receiving the penalty that we deserve for our sins. And here is the great question you may have. How can... <laughs> how... Can I get what Jesus did to count for me? Jesus did everything necessary for your sins to be forgiven. He did everything necessary for you to be clothed in perfect righteousness. He did everything necessary for you to safely enter into heaven. But how do you avail yourself of what Jesus did? And here's Paul's answer. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, and you will be saved. Now, don't get, get too casual and nonchalant, careless with that word believe. Some people have a tendency to think of the word believe as simply mere intellectual assent. Ask them, do you believe in Jesus? They said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And what they mean is, I believe that there was a man, I intellectually accept the fact that there was a man who lived back centuries ago named Jesus. And they're kind of in the, the same arena as they would be in if you were asking them if they believe in George Washington. They'd say, yes, I, I believe that there was a man named George Washington. That's not true biblical belief. My wife, Sylvia, and I were married. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. But uh, before, I was, before we were married, I had an intellectual comprehension of, of marriage. I began pastoring at age 16. I had already performed wedding ceremonies. Not very well in those years, but I, I had performed wedding ceremonies. I, I understood Weddings, and I understood marriage. I had an intellectual comprehension of it, and I also agreed with marriage. I believed marriage was a good thing. Was I married? Was I married simply because I understood marriage? No. Was I married simply because I agreed that marriage was a good and beneficial thing? No. But there came that day when Sylvia and I stood before a pastor, and that pastor said, do you take this woman to be your, your wife? And now, we enter into another realm. I was committing myself to her. And oh, dear friends, to believe in Jesus is not just to say, yes, I suppose a man named Jesus lived all those years ago. Yes, I, I agree that he was a good man. To believe in Jesus is to say, oh, Lord God, I take Jesus as the only possible way that I can enter into the glory of heaven. I renounce everything else, my dependence on everything else. I renounce my dependence on good works, church membership. I rest myself solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Give that word believe its full force. Now let me come to a conclusion here by 
just mentioning the third thing that we learn from this children. The first thing, there's a great danger to avoid. What is that great danger? Going out into eternity and not being prepared. Not having your sins forgiven. But there's a great Savior to receive. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, there's a great joy to experience. I read there in verse 34 of this Philippian jailer. He rejoiced along with his entire, entire household that he had believed in God. If you go back or through a few pages here in the book of Acts, back to chapter 8, you come across an, an Ethiopian eunuch and you come across Philip preaching Jesus to him. And you would read at the end of that story that he went on his way rejoicing. The Ethiopian eunuch did. And here this Philippian jailer is rejoicing in the salvation that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have to say this is the part of the story that surprises me the least. There are many surprising things here in this account. It's surprising that uh, Paul and Silas are singing praises to God there in their agony and there in the darkness of the prison. It's surprising that this earthquake came and my, what a targeted earthquake it was. It jarred the prison doors open and broke the chains of these men. Surprising things here, but this doesn't surprise me. This man, after he was saved, rejoiced. He rejoiced. He, he now didn't have to fear death any longer, so he rejoiced. He didn't have to fear meeting God any longer, so he rejoiced. He didn't have to fear judgment any longer, so he rejoiced. He didn't have to fear condemnation anymore, so he rejoiced. Rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I grew up in a little Baptist church up in central Illinois. And I have to tell you, the songs we sang in that little Baptist church often linked being saved with rejoicing. There's that song by Jack Schofield, Saved by His Power Divine, Saved to New Life Sublime, Life Now is Sweet, and my, listen, my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. And then there's that great hymn, Love by Baptist, for so many generations, written by Horatio Spafford. And it has that verse that says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glory, thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, listen, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And then I think of those words from Philip Bliss, guilty, vile, and helpless we Spotless Lamb of God was he, speaking about Jesus. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Listen, full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah. What a Savior. I'd call that rejoicing, wouldn't you? Hallelujah. What a Savior. I will say to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have plenty of things to lament in our churches today. 
But I think perhaps the thing that we should be lamenting most in our churches today is that so many of us seem to have lost the wonder of salvation. Philip Bliss's words, full atonement, can it be? That's about how we would say and how we would sing. That we don't have that hallelujah about us. And my hope in this sermon has been twofold. If you're not a Christian, I hope that the Spirit of God has driven an arrow into your heart today and caused you even now to ask, what must I do to be saved? And God's answer is the same. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But if you are a Christian today, I've also had this aim in view, and that is to encourage you to get the wonder of your salvation back, to encourage you to rejoice, even as this Philippian jailer rejoiced. I read these words back in uh, the book of Deuteronomy where Moses said to the people of Israel, "Who, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? And I urge you, who are Christians today, to to feel the wonder in that question that Moses raised. Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? Dear friend, if you're saved, you've got the greatest blessing that God has to bestow. Now, it may be today that you've got all kinds of headaches and aggravations and you may have serious physical problems You may have serious financial problems, but the Christian, no matter what his problems are, the Christian can always say, yes, but I'm I'm saved. I'm saved. And I want to tell you this, the Christian on his worst day is better off than the unbeliever is on his best day. Oh, there's nothing more wonderful, more glorious, more magnificent than God's plan of salvation. There's nothing more marvelous and wonderful for you, for you personally than receiving that plan of salvation. May God help you today, if you're not a Christian, to flee to Christ. Flee to Christ. While you have opportunity, before you're out in eternity, flee to Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian today and the shine has gone off your Christianity and you've settled into a dull familiarity, I would urge you today to examine your heart And to come to the Lord and say, oh God, forgive me forever, allowing this to become old. Make it new today. Make it new to me. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. Pastor Aaron, Pastor Doug will be here to receive you. If you're not a Christian, we urge you today to flee to Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you are a Christian who needs to get the wonder and the glory back, come, let one of these men pray with you today. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to go over familiar ground. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to think about life's great issues. Oh, God, help us to realize there's eternity stretching out there before us. Eternity may receive us before we can imagine. Oh, God, help us to prepare. And help us to know there's only one way to prepare, and that's by believing in the Lord Jesus. Oh, God, help that person who has never believed to do so today. And help your people who have believed to Rejoice afresh and anew in the wonder and glory of their salvation. Oh God, would you do your work in our hearts and lives in these moments.
to the glory of your name. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.